Welcome to Spooky History. In today's episode, we're looking at the famous case of the Amityville Horror. The story of the Amityville Horror is one of the most famous true stories of a haunting, and we have recently seen at least one chapter of it come to an end with the death of Ronald DeFeo on March 12th of 2021. There are many points where this story can be said to begin. My personal one starts with a copy of The Amityville Horror by Jay Anson, which was found in a cardboard box, sold and seen at auction after its previous owner had died, and given to me by the buyer of the box who didn't want to keep it. <laughs> Maybe that explains all the bad stuff that's happened to me since 2005. Hmm. Well, personal anecdotes aside, an uncontroversial place to start the story is November the 13th, 1974. Unfortunately, a Wednesday. Ugh. Ronald DeFeo Jr. was 23 years old. He had finished a day's work and gone home to 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, Long Island, where he made a shocking discovery. At around 6.30pm, he burst into the local watering hole, Henry's Bar, and declared, You gotta help me. I think my mother and father are shot. The people who went back with him, and then the police, found Ronald's parents, Ronald Sr. and Louise, and his four younger siblings, Dawn, Alison, Mark, and John Matthew, all laying face down in bed, dead. There was so much blood, it took a forensic expert to locate where Dawn and Alison had actually been shot. Now, at first, Ronald was taken into protective custody. You see, his father's uncle was Peter DeFeo, a Kappa regime in the Genovese crime family, and Ronald Jr. told the police that he thought the killings had been carried out by a mob hitman, Louis Fellini. However, Fellini had an alibi, proving he was out of state at the time and Donald DeFeo Jr. had something of a history. Firstly, he was a gun fanatic. Secondly, his father was a violent and angry man, and he and his son had often come to blows. Junior once tried to break up a fight between his parents by pointing a rifle at his father, saying, Leave that woman alone. I'm going to kill you, you fat fuck. This is it. And firing it. For some reason, the gun didn't work, so he then simply put the rifle down and left the room as if nothing out of the ordinary had actually happened. Thirdly, by the time of the murders, DeFeo had already had to see a psychiatrist for his behaviour and was a routine abuser of alcohol, heroin, and speed, and just a few weeks before, he had staged a mugging to steal $1,800 from the family business he worked at doing very little. Less than five days before the murders, when his father confronted him about why he wasn't cooperating with the police, Junior said, You fat prick, I'll kill you, and drove off. After the murders, he asked the police what steps he had to take in order to collect on his father's life insurance, which, in itself, is slightly suspicious in the immediate aftermath of your entire family's death. And then, of course, was the matter of the 35 caliber gun box found in Donald's room, the same caliber used on the victims. So, overall, the police had a few reasons to think that maybe the sole survivor of this family had something to do with the murders, and DeFeo was arrested. He maintained Fellini was responsible, but couldn't explain why his family were all in bed in pyjamas if they had been killed in the afternoon. Then he claimed Fellini and a man he couldn't describe had made him watch as they killed his family in the night, and he admitted getting rid of the evidence, even though he couldn't explain why, as there was no apparent reason it would incriminate him. The inconsistencies and lies were piling up. The day after the murders, he confessed, saying, Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Rather chillingly, he told the police how after killing his family, he had taken a bath, changed his clothes, got rid of his bloodstained ones and the rifle and cartridges, gone into work as usual, and then gone for several drinks with friends, leaving his family where they lay until he found them again 15 hours later. At his trial, DeFeo's defense lawyer, William Weber, made an insanity plea, understandably, with DeFeo claiming that he killed his family in self-defense because he heard their voices plotting against him. The jury wasn't convinced, though, and on November 21st, 1975, DeFeo was found guilty on six counts of second-degree murder and later sentenced to six sentences of 25 years to life. America is crazy. He was held at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in the town of Fallsburg, New York, until his move to a hospital and death in 2021. DeFeo's claims to have heard voices is, of course, the foundation of the later story. 
Only a few weeks after his conviction, George Lutz, his wife Kathy, and their three children moved into the murder house on Ocean Avenue and fled after living there for only 28 days, claiming to have been terrorised by paranormal phenomena. This included a disembodied male voice telling a priest to get out, making him bleed and trying to kill him in his car, Kathy levitating in her sleep, George waking up each night at the time of the murders, and slime oozing down the walls. They also heard noises, including a marching band in the living room in the middle of the night, saw a demonic pig with glowing eyes outside the window, and George was bitten by an animal statue in the house. Jay Hansen, the author of the book that made the story famous and was made into a film, has himself hinted at strange occurrences happening while he was writing the book. Said book was based on around 45 hours of audio recordings the Lutz adults made for him, detailing their time in the house. But both it and DeFeo's claims have been received sceptically in some quarters. Understandably. DeFeo's claim was, of course, his fourth version of the events after his two mob hit stories and his police confession. And it wouldn't be the last either. In a 1992 interview for The Times, he claimed Weber, his lawyer, had pursued the insanity defence against his wishes. William Weber gave me no choice. He told me I had to do this. He told me there would be a lot of money from book rights and a movie. He would have me out in a couple of years and I would come into all of that money. The whole thing was a con, except for the crime. Speaking of the crime, six years earlier, DeFeo had stated it was actually his sister Dawn who had killed their father, and then his mother had killed everyone else apparently with a revolver before being killed by Ronald Jr. in self-defence. Then in 1990, DeFeo claimed that Dawn had killed them with someone else who fled the house before DeFeo could get a good look at him, and that Dawn had then been killed accidentally by DeFeo as they struggled over the rifle. Later still, author Rick Osuna claimed DeFeo told him he had committed the murders with his sister Dawn and two friends, Orgy De Genero and Bobby Kelsk, out of desperation, because his parents had plotted to kill him. Jesus Christ. Even discounting the constant changes, many individual facts in them were verifiably false, with marriages backdated over a decade, involvement by people who never existed, and no sign of any of the different struggles that DeFeo claimed to have happened. And he disagreed with the insanity defence? Needless to say, none of the DeFeo's post-trial claims have received much traction or succeeded in reducing his sentence. Turning back to the Lutzes, it is undeniable there were at least some changes and additions to the supposed true story. Names being changed is understandable, but places being made up and people denying the roles of the book claims they played are slightly less excusable. A lot of what can be checked is also a bit off, such as the claim the house stood on Native American burial grounds, which has no backing whatsoever unless you've seen Poltergeist. William Weber, the lawyer who DeFeo himself accused of making up the story for money, said in the September 1979 issue of People magazine, I know this book is a hoax. We, George and Kathy Lutz and Weber, created this horror story over many bottles of wine. Neighbours and subsequent owners of the house have also disputed various facts, and the facts themselves have changed in different editions of the book, and then in the sequel book, The Amityville Horror Part 2, written by John G. Jones. This is… this is weird. Um, despite claiming also to be based on a true story, it retells some of the same events as the first book entirely differently and closer to what happened in the film which had come out in the meantime. Um, okay. This book was then followed by two more which, despite claiming on the cover that the terrifying true story continues, also had a disclaimer which read, This book is a work of fiction. The author created this story. Because of course he did. The story being based on real events reported in the media and being most famously known under the name of the town they occurred in make both it and its brand public domain. Many have taken advantage of this copyright-free franchise, with at least 28 films positioning themselves as either based on the story or sequels to it. In fact, four came out in 2020 alone, including The Amityville Vibrator, which I, I haven't seen, but I'm sure is a horror masterpiece and entirely accurate. Another recent adaptation featured briefly in The Conjuring 2, which definitely did claim to be inspired by true events, and which reported that the events of Ocean Avenue were caused by a demonic nun named Valak, who was also involved in the case of the Enfield Poltergeist. We're going to need you to cite some sources there, James Wan. DeFeo's unsound mind and questionable trustworthiness is, at this point, very much on the record. As for the Lutzes, they always maintained the events in the book were mostly true, and they apparently passed a polygraph test in June 1979, though the science behind those is inconsistent to say the least. Yeah, 
Um, bullshit is, is more accurate. But one wonders if any parent would go through the immense stress of moving their entire family into a house just to move them all out a month later based on the rather nebulous promise of later riches, which in the case of DeFeo hadn't materialised. And how did DeFeo fire eight times without anyone in the house waking up or changing position, or any of the neighbours hearing? The jury is still out. Well, not in DeFeo's case, because in his case it held him entirely responsible for his actions. But whether all of this was the work of a disturbed individual and his scheming lawyer, or supernatural entities hell-bent on murder, I think we can all agree the world can be a strange and dangerous place, and that gun control could help a lot of things, even possible demonic possession. Smash that dislike button. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Spooky History. You can find us on most social media at Spooky Hist Show, and you can support us with donations at paypal.me forward slash noisy ghost. If you have suggestions for future episodes, leave them in the comments. Thanks for watching, and please do have nightmares. Goodbye. Who was also involved in the case of the Enfield poltergeist? Do you want to go back? <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to go back a bit further, please? <laughs> Sorry, I can't help that anymore. Okay. <laughs>